Welcome back to the report. Now, last night, London-based think tank Claystone launched their report called A Decade Lost to Rethinking Radicalization and Extremism at the House of Commons. The report was written by Professor Aaron Kundani, who's author of Muslims are, The Muslims Are Coming, Islamophobia, Extremism and the Domestic War on Terror. Our reporter, Yasmin Khatun, went along to find out more. Where there is a, a, a very um, striking consistency Right. As counter-terrorism holds on to its position as a major focus for parliamentarians, <coughs> last night in the House of Commons, London-based think tank Claystone launched their report, A Decade Lost, Rethinking Radicalization and Extremism, a report written by author Arun Kundani. Journalists, politicians and activists from various groups attended the launch, which followed the third reading of a controversial counter-terror bill, one which has raised concern amongst many. At the launch, different threads came into mention as figures debated the productiveness of government strategy prevent, British values and the overbearing theme of the evening, the need to rethink current counter-terror policy. We asked author Aaron Kudnani about his findings. So the report we've produced looks at the underlying assumptions that have informed counterterrorism policy over the last 10 years. And one of the things that we're focusing on is what I call the official narrative of the causes of terrorism. Right? So we're trying to say, how does the government think about what causes terrorism? Because unless you have an, a sound analysis of what causes terrorism, your counterterrorism policy isn't going to work. And the argument the report makes, based on empirical evidence and drawing on other academic studies, is that the analysis the government has is flawed. It doesn't stand up to the empirical evidence that we have about what causes terrorism. The government's analysis focuses almost entirely on the idea that religious ideology in some way causes terrorism. And what we're saying is, is that actually um, there's multiple causes to terrorism and religious ideology has been massively exaggerated as the, as the factor that drives it. We used to have in local the last decade has seen a rise of the phrase British values becoming central to countering terror in the country. Radical or conservative religious leanings seen as a counter to these values. So in order to prevent terrorist activity, a clear agenda was set to curb any ideas as such and prevent terrorism from taking place. But according to this report, on account of what actually causes terrorism, this opinion propagated by government agenda doesn't hold scholarly scrutiny and is in actuality counterproductive. Creating this atmosphere that uh, of them and us, right, that Muslims are somehow this problem community um, and um, that there's some need for Muslims to, so to integrate themselves into so-called British values. All of these kind of notions have come out of counter-terrorism policy making and create this idea that, um, that there's, a, there's a problem with Muslims in Britain. Right? And terrorism is actually not about um, religious ideology, it's, a, it's about um, politics ultimately, right, and we have done a very bad job of understanding how our foreign policy for example, contributes to creating political contexts within which terrorism becomes more likely. We'd much rather talk about you know, extremist ideology, lack of British values and all this kind of stuff, which doesn't really get to the heart of the problem. In this report, Kinnani argues the better way to preventing terrorist violence is to focus on individuals and widen the breadth of opinion allowed to be expressed. Ten years on from the worst instance of terrorism here in Britain, is a radical rethink needed in order to save another decade being lost? Yasmin Khatoun, um, The Report. Well, rejoining us in the studio is Dr. Rizwan Sabir, who's Associate Professor at Edge Hill University. On the line, Dr. Julian Richards, co-director at the Centre for Security and Intelligence Studies at Buckingham University. And on the phone, Yasmin Qureshi MP, Labour MP at for Bolton South East. Um, welcome to the programme, all of you. Um, Yasmin, first of all, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I think it's first safe to say that um, in the wake of the events in Paris, we're probably going to see another twist in the spiral of this story. And yet the report um, is indicating that probably many of the things that will be said will be unhelpful. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, a lot of the people who kind of believe that religion is a cause for all this will just say, here, see, we told you, these people, uh, you know, insulted the, the, the prophet, and then so these people think we're going to come and avenge his death, and therefore, you know, Islam is the problem, the religion is the problem, and the people are the problem, which we know is completely wrong, because there's nothing Islamic, and I'm sure the Prophet ﷺ must be turning in his grave knowing that things are being carried out in his name. Um, so it makes the argument to say that actually people commit criminal offences not because of 
a religious motivation is often actually either because I genuinely believe that, uh, you know, it's for they want to go against powerful people, they want to, or they think it's the powerful people, or they may have political causes, which they want to perceive as, uh, you know, injustices that they say are happening. Um, I mean, a classic example is ISIS. Um, I think what a lot of people don't know is that most of the ISIS were the 100,000-odd um, young Sunnis, males who were put into prison in Iraq with the, with the help of uh, the Americans. So there are a number of different reasons why people do things. But actually, public religion probably got very little to do with it. But you have to write the events in Paris do not help. And now it's like you have to, re- you know, the, 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 the whole issue becomes even more difficult. And it's an uphill struggle. And the rise of anti-Muslim sentiments across the whole of Europe now. You know, there have been demonstrations in Germany recently. There have been demonstrations in different parts of, and even now people, you know, in France. So, uh, absolutely right, a lot of unhelpful comments are going to be said, and one of the most unhelpful comments is going to be that this is somehow linked with religion. It mm. isn't. Okay. Dr. Julian Richards, what, what do you make of the report? Do you think that it's true that, uh, that, that a lot of the kind of terrorism policies is framed wrongly? Well, um, there are some very important points that Aaron Kundani makes, um, and that, that point we heard in the interview there, that um, terrorism is more about politics than about religion is, is a very, very important point and, and, and a very valid point. However, um, to suggest that, that there are two things worth saying. One is that to suggest there is, there is no link between extreme religious ideology, um, albeit that's not shared by the majority of people in a particular religious faith, and political ideology is foolish. Of course, there are, uh, there are some links. Um, religion can be a political ideology in certain circumstances. Um, and the other, um, the other point to make is that this, um, Kudnani says that we should focus on individuals and not ideologies. And that's absolutely right, of course. Um, however, certain vulnerable individuals are, we know, are naive and they are swayed by particular uh, extreme religious ideologies. So there is a link there that we have to try and um, carefully disentangle and, and, and pull out. Um, we can't throw the baby out with a bathwater, in my view. Mm. This one. So, so some link, but overplayed, I guess, would be a, a, a summary of Dr. Richard's position. How do you feel about it? I would agree with that um, perspective that um, religious ideology, of course, has its part in explaining why people resort to armed violence. Um, but there has been a tendency in the post-9-11 discourse um, that religious ideology or religious doctrine uh, is largely responsible for causing the violence. Now there is a difference between somebody interpreting a religious doctrine in a particular way and then using that to justify their actions. But it's very important to remember, and this is where I agree with the speaker, that there is a political context to those actions for which the religious doctrine is used. So ultimately the act is actually political, which is being used, uh, justified, through religious doctrine. And, and I totally agree that we shouldn't play uh, uh, the role of ideology. In fact, um, a, a key individual has just recently come out, Mark Sageman, um, who used to be a, a proponent of the idea that religious ideology was largely involved, and then has come out and, and essentially gone against that idea, saying that, that, that socioeconomic and political factors are more important to factor in mm. when trying to explain. So that, that shift there uh, does suggest that the doctor Let's just draw out a little discourse. bit where that kind of mistaken emphasis might take you, though, because, I mean, uh, I guess it's what lies behind the sort of conveyor belt theory of extremism, you know, that you listen in a particular religious context to a particular religious idea, and then two steps down the line, you're shooting somebody in the, in the street. Uh, is the point here that by, by isolating and exaggerating one aspect of it, um, we miss the actual real motivators of, of, of people acting in this way? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the conveyor belt theory does not stand up to uh, empirical scrutiny, and it's very important to base any policy on an uh, evidential basis. The evidence for the conveyor belt theory, the idea that nonviolence leads to violence or nonviolent ideas lead to violence, uh, um, has been largely rejected by um, people relying on evidence. So it's a weak argument, and you're absolutely right that it does lead to the formulation of policy that is misguided and misinformed, and actually misses the real causes behind the violence, mm. uh, which are not 
largely restricted to ideology, which are, which are ultimately political. But by downplaying the role of politics, what the state does is it actually underplays its own political adventures in certain nations that actually perpetuate this conflict uh, between these different groups. I mean, yes, I mean, I mean that, that point there that, that um, Razan was just making at the end of his contribution where he's saying, look, you know, if we're going to broaden this out and we're going to look at causes, foreign policy is right up there with them, isn't it? Well, yes, and I wrote uh, I've a comment about the fact that the whole thing about terrorism going on, you cannot divorce foreign policy from it. You cannot divorce... There is an element, as you say, of an interpretation uh, of a religion as well. And there is one element which people often perhaps don't talk about, is that sometimes a lot of these people are of vulnerable... Quite a lot of them are vulnerable-minded people. A lot of them have been... Certain of them certainly, you know, have been almost uh, brainwashed into thinking that this is I Islamic ideology. And the fourth thing people seem to forget constantly is that most of these, you know, terrorists, right, or crimes, actually killing other Muslims. You know, in the whole phase of the Middle East and recently, it's them um, killing co religionists. So this, the issues are complex. And our sort of approach across all politicians and across the country, across the world, is a completely wrong approach. They have to look at, um, you know, our foreign policies. They've got to look at how you can be a religious, um, sort of Islamic extremist religious, how you counter that um, narrative as well. And that's where perhaps the maybe people in the Muslim community need to actually get up and actually, you know, some of the scholars and do that counter-narrative. Mm. But it's out there. So that's part of the, the thing. And, the, and one of the really important reasons why we need the, I think, counter-narrative, I to say what these people are doing and nothing to do with Islam, is because a lot of people, in this, in, especially in the West, think that these are all Islamically linked. They actually believe this is Islam. And we need to actually, people need to say this is not Islam. And that is, I think, the responsibility of, um, so you could say, everybody. Mm. Um, and it's important because, you know, the rise of Islamophobia in the whole of Western world is going up and up. And the image of Islam and Muslim in, in Tarnish. So it's not just about, you know, the issue about... It's, Fred, Fred, we're losing the signal there for a moment. So just let me put some of the points to, uh, to, um, to Dr. Richards. Um, isn't it, the isn't it the case, Dr. Richards, that unless we um, have a more sophisticated analysis and a more sophisticated public dialogue about the causes of terrorism, that um, some of the scenes that we've seen in Germany with the uh, anti-Islamic demonstrations there, quite big ones, um, some of the things that we've uh, seen going on uh, in in France with um, legislation, which I think most people in this country wouldn't support, that those those polarizations are going to get more extreme? Yes, they are. And, and this is a huge risk here. Um, and and there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of ignorance. There's a lot of fear, uh, quite frankly, that we have to, to, to take note of. Um, and we've all learned a great deal about um, terrorism and radicalization. We haven't got the answers yet by any means, but one thing we've learned in recent years, which is kind of what Mark Sageman is now saying, is that there isn't a simple and, and neat explanation, much as um, governments and the public would like there to be one, um, between how, you know, how people become radicalized, if that's the right term, and how they turn to terrorism. It's, it's a very individual thing that relates to um, specific individuals with specific political grievances. So we're, we're, we're finding out that this is much, much more complex and, and variable than, than we realise. But the, there is a huge danger that we're seeing across Europe, not so much here in the UK, thankfully, but in other parts of Europe, um, where communities are becoming polarised through fear and ignorance, really. And, and, and the more it works in both directions, and we have to take note of that. You know, when the, the attack that happened in Paris today will be um, will be fed upon by extremists on the, on the right and, and will be mobilized as a um, this is why we need to to take action and it's a, it's a very dangerous state of affairs
Mm. Rizman, do you think that we're any way down the road? I mean, the Claystone report is obviously an important report. How much publicity it'll get, how much it seeps into the, the public dialogue. That, that's a more difficult thing to judge, isn't it? And, and when you put by, side by side, you know, the kind of, the kind of information that's at, in that report with the huge howl that's going to go on emerging from the events in Paris, it's difficult to see how a, a, a more sophisticated analysis is going to make its way through. I mean, uh, in the immediate uh, aftermath of any violent attack, it's something as sophisticated as Paris. Um, uh, fear uh, takes over and people's rational faculties tend to weaken. And that is actually the worst time to try and have a reasoned debate. But that is actually when we do need to have the most reasoned debate. It's absolutely essential, otherwise we can get lost in this prism of fear and paranoia and, uh, and lead to bad policy decisions, which ultimately complicate uh, the, the, the problem even further. Um, but yes, absolutely, I think uh, Paris, uh, along with uh, um, other issues that are currently going on, will make um, the findings of this, this report and other really solid and good pieces of research uh, that have recently come uh, in, into the public domain uh, a lot harder to swallow. Uh, and, and certainly accept for policy makers because it will be saying things um, that seem to be, uh, you, you have to recognize that when it comes down to issues such as terrorism and counterterrorism, there is a, a massive issue of public opinion and public support, tough on terrorism, tough on the causes of terrorism as was famously said on a new labor. And if there is any inclination that the government is being weak on terrorism, then that ultimately reduces uh, the chances of that um, political party maintaining power or certainly acquiring votes. So what you find is that in the midst of all this highly securitized, highly sensitive work is a politicization of, of policy and it's ultimately that politicization that disallows really solid and concrete pieces of research to have some kind of resonance within policy circles until we depoliticize the issue of counterterrorism and security. I'm afraid that we're still going to be facing an uphill struggle. What about the role of public campaigning in terms of magnifying the uh, the the message that comes out of reports like the Close Down Report? Because I mean, I thought it was interesting in the discussion earlier when we were talking to um, the uh, the correspondent in Paris that was saying that there's no equivalent. He made the point. He said there's no equivalent of a of a body like Cage, for instance, um, the campaigning organisation, Muslim campaigning organisation, and you know, I guess there's quite a lot of that in in Britain. You could see in the in the House of Commons report. There, there's figures like Peter Oborn from the right of the political spectrum, but who do campaign around this. Is this an important element in making sure that the sort of um, the information contained in the Claystone report actually gets out to the public? Uh, absolutely, civil society has an absolutely essential and critical role to play in putting things on the agenda, um, so policymakers can't ignore them. Uh, the extent to which policymakers are willing to listen um, to those that don't necessarily say the things that policymakers wish to hear is obviously an extremely difficult challenge. How do you gain, ultimately you're, the question is how do you influence change in the corridors of power? And, and you know, political theory has been trying to address these questions for hundreds of years. But ultimately civil society has an absolutely essential and critical role to play. Organizations like CAGE are at the very forefront of trying to put things on the, uh, on the agenda. They find it extremely difficult with the challenges that they've faced. Um, but now what we find is that civil society is largely being targeted by the state. The counterterrorism and security bill, which is being debate, debated in Parliament as we speak, is ultimately trying to uh, interpolate civil society into a, a, a legislative structure which makes it a legal obligation on civil society, I'm talking traditional civil society, education, health, mental health, statutory partners, to essentially report people um, to, the, to the authorities and the police services whom are considered to be vulnerable to radicalization. Civil society should be a domain that is ultimately left free to ensure that the most appropriate policies uh, and the most appropriate knowledge can be devised in order to produce the most effective solutions. Therefore, politicians should try and stay away and, 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 and keep clear of that domain. But what we largely find now is that civil society is being pierced by the state in order to shape and mold the, the debate in a particular trajectory. Trajectory, and I think that's extremely problematic and, and can be potentially counterproductive. Okay, Dr. Rizman Sabir, Yasmin Karishi, MP, and Dr. Julian Richards, thanks very much for that. But I'm afraid it's all we've got time for on this episode of uh, The Report. I want to thank all my guests on today's show and to thank you at home for watching. 
do remember. You can keep up with us on Twitter by following at Islam Channel and using the hashtag The Report. But for now, we'll leave you with scenes from Sri Lanka, where the final preparations are being made ahead of presidential elections tomorrow. It's expected to be one of the closest elections to date. Till tomorrow, good night.